recording. Okay. Hi. So this is about um, the history and future of free software font editors. I wanted to just kind of start by explaining I had a, an experience working, teaching a type design class that really pushed me to be interested in this kind of stuff. So I wanted to just kind of explain how I got interested in this and then go into like all the things that have come before and all the stuff that's happening now. So, oh, so it was at, um, I think it started in 2000, 2013 or 12, but I had just taken like evening type design classes at Cooper Union. And so I was doing that and I was also doing like, I was doing a lot of graphic design for artists and cultural groups in Bushwick, because this was like a Bushwick neighborhood computer. And um, so I could kind of show the, so I was doing like, a lot of graphic design work that was basically it was like artists and cultural people with no budget needed images they could use to promote their events so this was and a lot of these events happen in a way that doesn't really facilitate like a regular graphic design experience so it's people like putting on art shows or doing cultural events like this was for um, an art show that my friend did, and it was called Thaw, and she needed just a, like, a graphic. And so I rendered this in Blender, which is like a free software um, 3D modeling thing, and she didn't really have time for me to actually like design any flyers for her. Like the way that a lot of that stuff works is like, they're just like last minute, like people are changing to the end. And a lot of those people work with traditionally trained graphic designers and they get frustrated and then stop because there's not enough, they don't have enough control over the process. Like those graphic designers are using software that they don't have access to. So it's like they deliver this product, this product that's not, and so I had this like really small, like working for free or for clothing or for like getting into like art events for free like graphic design thing going on with all these um, people around this group. I was doing, um, so this was, this was like a typeface I, I designed. We were working, um, it was potentially gonna be used for the clock tower gallery, um, but the, the client didn't like the typeface we were designing, so they gave the job to Lawrence Wiener, which <laughs> if you know, like Lawrence Wiener is like a, he's like a well-known like typographic, he's an artist that works in type. He's very interesting, but it's an interesting experience to lose a job to like one of your role models, <laughs> like someone you look up to. Yeah. Um, you know, it's hard to be mad about that kind of stuff. <laughs> I thought it was way better than what we were doing. <laughs> like, what we were doing was terrible. I was, I was trying to design a typeface in Robofont, and I didn't know anything about finishing a typeface project. Mm -hmm. Like, the, I mean, that's something I'm still learning about. But, like, how to actually produce a typeface that you can hand off to yeah. someone to use yeah. instead of just something you give to, like, a friend for their um, so like I, I would do a lot of design for this group like multitask and they, it was a similar thing they just needed images that they could put um, that they could um, put together themselves in pirated versions of Photoshop because all these people have pirated versions of Photoshop so I would make these images. Yeah, like I would basically hand off like design kits. Oh, so like okay. this would be like a multitask design kit, which is like, I'm not gonna do your design for you because um, 
you know, you're doing it all last minute, it's all yeah. changing, so, but I can give you kits to use. Yeah. And so that was a big part of me getting into doing, like getting into Libre type, because it became obvious to me that like, you can't buy a proprietary typeface and say, here, like add this to your yeah. design kit. Um, so that got me really excited about it. Um, yeah. I had, this is kind of like um, the portfolio. This is all the work I was doing in proprietary software. So I was using RoboFont and I was designing all these fonts in RoboFont, but I was never finishing them. And I wasn't really, I wasn't really happy with the, the software I was using. Um, but then the thing, so this project was, I was working for the computer lab and the, there was this arts organization that said, let's have a computer lab for kids in the neighborhood that can drop in and we'll have different people teach digital art classes at this lab. And it seemed like a really good idea. Um, and I started to have a disagreement this is when like Raspberry Pis were getting really popular, and I started to like kind of have a disagreement with the the main directors because they were all spending a lot of money getting Macintoshes, like they were getting iMacs, and they were um, setting all these iMacs up with proprietary software. And their thinking was that like these are the tools we use in art school, yeah, and so we're going to provide these proprietary tools that we use in art school to kids in the neighborhood so they can come in and drop in the lab. But what I ran into, so I started teaching this type design class, I only had one student finish. Well, I mean, it's amazing that like a neighborhood kid, I had like three or four people come in and like try to make a typeface, but I actually had one person come in and finish the project of making a typeface. We were using RoboFont and she had a Windows PC at home. And so RoboFont is a Mac only, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's Mac only software. And she couldn't work on it at home or like, I mean, I just felt like the entire experience of like teaching someone RoboFont just felt pointless because they couldn't use it. Um, and so then I started looking at FontForge and like trying to get into learning about like cross-platform font editors. So the history of, um, let's see. So the, the history of free software font editors kind of starts with um, Donald Knuth, who made uh, Metafont and uh, Latte. And he, he's like a really religious guy. And so he had this idea that like he has this like, like kind of like egalitarian worldview driven by his like religious background where he sees mathematics as just this thing that exists, a gift from God and that in order to like take something like a typeface, which is just a bunch of numbers and, or computer programs like, um, and he, he was kind of before like free software or open source. So he was kind of like a pioneer in these ideas, but he, he was never really dogmatic about it, which I also thought was nice. Um, so just to do um, like, oops. Oh, I'm there. So I have, this is just a really quick um, example of this A is a Metafont file. And so this is how you describe a glyph in Metafont. It's, a, it's not the most like readable. Um, and so, let's see. Actually compiling it is kind of a pain you have to do this, oh wait, first you have to do Metafont. Yay, then it did that. So that, I compiled it, so MF 
a.mf compiles it, then you do gf to dvi, which converts to dvi, and then you do xdvi, and so that launches. Whoa! Damn. So that so it renders it at a certain size, or it <laughs> creates a glyph. Or? It creates a glyph. And it has, it's this really kind of cool, like it's, this thing it brings up is basically like a glyph editor. Uh, <laughs> it has like tons of features. Um, but so this was kind of in a way like the first real like free software font editor. If you exclude, um, obviously like the very first computers had fonts because that's like the basic like way you enter information on a computer is a terminal, and a terminal is just type. Um, but those were like very simple, like bitmap right. editing software. So um, after that, like in the 80s, so there was, um, people were starting to make fonts on computers. There were like bitmap fonts. Um, but graphic designer, like graphic designers still use all the very traditional ways of making type. And the super interesting thing is there's a really good podcast interview with um, Rudy. So there, Emma Gray was like a, a magazine about design theory. And um, Zuzana Lithko, I think her last name yeah. was, who's like a really amazing type designer. She basically pioneered the whole concept of selling digital fonts. Um, they were making this magazine about graphic design theory. They weren't really making any money doing this because like, it's making a magazine. Like, it's almost impossible. But graphic designers would read this, and they would see the fonts she was designing on the Macintosh. And they would write in and say, where do I get this? I want to use this in my design. And they started off, they would just typeset things and mail them to people on paper. Like people would say like, typeset me a line of text and then mail it to me. And so they were doing that for a while and then eventually they started selling the fonts on floppy disk. And then when the internet came along, they realized, oh, we can license these fonts and sell them online, which is now like a huge business that thousands of people take part in. But it was basically, um, like when it was being invented, um, serious graphic designers didn't take it serious. They didn't think it would ever amount to anything. <laughs> and I think that's interesting, like, you know, like, ser like they didn't, like Massimo Vignelli called yeah. Emma Gray Magazine a garbage factory. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, I mean... That's the history of technology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like so cinema yeah. Is, is everywhere. Like, photo photography, like, photography is not art. Yeah, so I'm always, like, I'm always looking for things that are like that. Like, I'm always thinking, like, what's, what's the thing that established people yeah. are missing out on? And I, yeah. because of my experiences, I think that, like, Libre type is definitely one of those things. Um, but anyway, so this was an interest. I had an interesting Twitter discussion with Letterform Archive, and they did. They asked her. And we found out like so. The original font. This is fantastic, but the original um, software she was using was like a public domain um, software that was just passed around a user group. Um, yeah. So then there's like comes like the free software movement. So there's Richard Stallman and like his like, he, I don't like the way he approaches the concept. Like he approaches it from a very like adversarial political concept, but I mean his his basic idea like if I could tone it down a little bit is that like using free software has like social impact on like society and like how computers are structured, or like how computers 
help shape society. And I think that like now, like people are slowly kind of just opening up to the idea that like technology went one way and it doesn't seem, there's certain parts of how technology acts in the world today that don't work very well. So I think it's really interesting to go back and look at like the original ideas that Richard Solomon had. But I, I'm not really that interested in being like dogmatic and political about it all the time. Like he famously, like he'll, people will ask him to, to watch Netflix with them and he'll refuse and give them a lecture. I don't, I don't think that's, I think that's just like true. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the thing that I really like, I think like the, for me, like the, the awesome feature of free software is that it's, it's not easy, but it's simple. And so there's this pro, there's this programmer I really like, named Rich Hickey. He does Closure, which is like it's like a a Lisp-like functional programming language like built on the JVM. But he's like obsessed with this like software architecture idea that um, people think like um, so if you use a like the this font editor Glyphs, which is one of the main proprietary font editors, it's really easy when you start using it. Um, but because it's proprietary software and it's only available on the Macintosh, it's not simple. And there's this, whenever you make software proprietary, you lose the sim simplicity of like you're always gonna have to like build walls around the software. And so like I think that what I look for in software is not that it's not that it's easy to start out with, because like a lot of free software is a pain when you start using it. But the simplicity supposedly will pay off for you in the long run when you actually understand what you're doing. Because I always have the experience, like, I'll start using, like, proprietary software, and then I'll be on a deadline, and I'll just be drowning in complexity and, like, things I, and, like, for someone that, like... You just want to export it. Yeah. And for someone that, like, for someone that, like, used to be a graphic designer is becoming more of a programmer, I look at files that graphic designers create, and they're a mess because they don't understand what's going on underneath. And so to me, graphic design is like organizing information. And so organizing information includes clean files and software architecture. And I'm really kind of starting to think of like writing clean, organized software, it, to me, is just graphic design. And like, and like writing readable Python is graphic design, and it's really hard. <laughs> but, but it's also interesting, it, like, I finished my master's program three years ago, mm -hmm. and was arguing with the faculty, you know, A, pushing the brand to the software, and also not teaching, like, teaching people the hours of the work, and teaching them to not work in this, like, documents and files. Yes. Yeah. do it. It's, well, it's, I mean, that's it's the, so weird. it's the simple, like, you're, people have the instinct to go for easy at the start. And with a lot of this stuff, like that's why it's popular, because it's easy to start with. And so you kind of have to cultivate a culture of like, like really good software is not going to be easy to use. Like you're, you might have to read an instruction manual or something. Yeah. Like, but you, you ideally see the payoff in the end understand your process. Yeah, I feel better when I understand like, Oh. You know? I, it gives me confidence. Yeah, for me, that's like now, like, now that I've gotten more into programming, it's just like, I have to understand, I just love that feeling of like, I understand everything that's yeah. going on and I'm in control of it. Yeah. And then I feel like, okay, I'm, whatever my concept of a designer is, like, that's my concept of a designer, is someone that's like in full control of the production process, like knows what's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I think we could like definitely like turn this into a debate about whether because I totally agree with you. I, 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 I'm, I'm on your side. That's not for everyone. It's but, just like. But exactly, and that's why, like, so for example, when I studied, I was really admirative of a, a colleague of mine. Who studied, I studied graphic design, and, and he's the first like computer graphics, uh, like, you know, like uh, courses that were in art schools, right? And so yeah. They didn't know how to teach it, and then like, you know, and we didn't have any Photoshop or anything. Through all those tools that I learned who are dead now. Anyway, but I remember I had a friend who was putting a ruler on the screen to align things, right? I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> Not recently, but I mean, I've done, so, definitely done that before. So for me, that was, that was never, never something I would do. I would, like, by principle, I would define myself saying, like, there is something I don't know that should exist or exist, and that should help me to do this. If not, software is bad for what I have to do. I mean, I have this thing where, like, I just don't understand the software enough to be able to do this, right? Yeah. Or the software is just badly designed. But for the job I was doing, which is aligning things and whatever. But at the same time, I was admirative of his, of, of his work around, right? I was like, yeah, why? What, what is the good approach to any tool? Is it to read the manual first and use it? Yeah. Or to just go, fuck it, right? Well, I want to design a font. I never use this, any <laughs> font design software, but let's go. I'm sure like <laughs> using the ruler on the screen probably creates like an aesthetic value. Like, I mean, that's all, like tools are always gonna like have these like really unseen ways that they affect how things look. And I mean, that's the other reason I'm really interested in this stuff because I think that, like, aren't like, our, like, ha like the tools we use to build the things that make our world, like they must, they, they, I think they affect us in really subtle ways that we don't understand, and that's, I mean, the, you kind of have to believe that to be interested in type design, yeah. or else like, you just use Helvetica Whatever. For, yeah. for everything. Yeah. Um, so then, so after I quit using, I quit using Robofont, even though I had a $500 license for it. <laughs> but I was like, okay, I have this $500 license for Robofont, but I really want to use like FontForge or something. Cause like, I want to use it on a Raspberry Pi. And so like, that was why I kind of wanted to show that like, so this is FontForge is written in C and it's the, it was designed by this guy, George Williams, and it was basically a, re a retirement project. He's like, I'm retired, and I want to yeah, take a photo. Yeah, I want to take a photo. this. I know. <laughs> it's really hard to use on that, but. <laughs> yeah, because I installed Blender on that. Like, that must be. Try. It worked. I got a lot of. The screen is too bright. It's yeah. like <laughs> But anyway, so. I should that the I used to work at um, Oh my god, I would be so cross and I if I worked on that. Well I, well, I used, I used to work so at um, so I used to work at um, there's a programming um, studio at Verso Books called Position Development and they're all like Haskell developers. Oh wow. And when I first got FontForge working on that, I brought it in and I showed everyone at lunch and like all the Haskell people were like, that's so cool. <laughs> and then the, the design director from like Jacobin Magazine came in and I was like, I showed him that and he just like rolled his eyes like as hard <laughs> as he possibly could. <laughs> trolling, you're using a troll. Yeah. Nicely done. <laughs> um, 
but anyway, um, so like I used FontForge for a while. Um, Dave Dave has been very involved with FontForge. Like Dave ran a project was, but they completely redid the. They wrote really fantastic docs. Like there's this site design with FontForge that Dave was involved with. Um, but the thing I learned from, so using FontForge, FontForge is open source, it's written in C, so I started trying to learn C to like dig into the FontForge code, and it's very, very difficult to understand what's going on. The, it hardly uses any dependencies, and the George, like the guy that wrote it, instead of using an existing widget toolkit, he just wrote his own like widget toolkit. It's so FontForge is just like this work of art from the sky that like is really hard for anyone else to use. So that got me really interested in like software architecture as design. Um, and that brought me to TrueFont, which is a project from Adrian Tetar. Tetar. Uh, he's uh, a French software developer that started, um, so he started working on TrueFont. It was originally a UFO font editor. And so the idea is there's another, so a UFO is a, so yeah, like a UFO is a, um, a font file. So a UFO is like an, a directory of like XML files. So this is like a font file and you have, it's in this directory called a UFO. And then so here's all your glyphs. And the glyphs are defined with XML. So you can kind of see, it's actually really beautiful. Like it's very readable. Um, and so this is like how you define an A in the UFO file. So um, TrueFont was originally designed to be a UFO editor. There was another UFO editor called RoboFont, which it kind of took a different approach to glyphs is like the kind of like the prosumer, like Canon camera. Like it's a professional tool, but it comes like totally packaged, ready to use. Where RoboFont had a different approach where it, it wanted to be like a bare bones tool that you built upon. And you would add, like it doesn't come with a shapes tool um, to begin with. So the, the, the really cool thing about um, TrueFont is it's written in Python 3. So you can install it in an editable mode where, so like, um, So we have our UFO here, and you can just do true font. And so here is, um, so this is running on, I have like a Python virtual environment, but so this is just installed on my computer and if I wanted to make any changes to it, I could do that, and it would the next time I launch it. Um, and so it has a has a very clean. And so this is the when I was talking about like a pull request I was working on. This is the the shapes tool was. Um, one of like my contributions to this. Was what? Oh, so I made the shapes tool and like made a pull request to the project and then it got accepted. So then if anyone uses TrueFont, I can say I made the shapes tool, which draws both circles and squares. How does it differ? Huh? How does it tell which one it is? Oh, you hold down shift? I think, okay, wait. 
Oh wait, no. Shift constrains it. So if you're just dragging normally, you can make rectangles. Okay, so it makes rectangles, ellipses, circles, and squares. Um, but so the shape stool is actually like it, it wasn't in this, and Robofont doesn't come with a shape stool. But I always think that that's like the most basic yeah. tool. Like when people start making a font, it's mostly squares and circles, yeah. and I've noticed just from teaching that class that people really struggle yeah. <laughs> if they Busy. don't have it when they yeah. start. So there's a very good online course called Busy. Uh, uh, and it's a website where you have to like, follow curves. Is it like JavaScript, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I've it done that. Teaches you how to use control points and, and, and modify them and, and draw along a line. Yeah, that, it's like um, what's the guy's name? He works for Mozilla. It's like Pomac. Something like that. No, it's a different thing. Oh. But it's a nice game. Yeah, it's a game. It's really fun. And then I worked on a project with Dave that we tried to make a font editor for the OLPC computer. But anyway, it's still in a pretty bad state, but... Uh, but I, I always want to pick this up and keep working on it, because I think... Well, did you see the post on, on Discourse about Mozilla letting out features? Uh -huh. It's from September to December, and they're looking for Yeah, I'm, well, I've been talking to, like, I take math classes at Lehman College in, Queen, in um, the Bronx, and so I was talking with a bunch of the people up there, and I'm going to try and get people up there involved in doing open source projects, because there's tons of, like, math students that, like, they're math students that have taken, like, computer science classes. Like they've taken like discrete math and like data structures and algorithms and they wanna like get experience but they don't have the time to do like an internship. So like I've been talking to them like you get these people that don't have time to do an internship if they're like math majors, like they could be working on like math heavy computer graphics stuff or um, but yeah. But the, like, so one really cool thing that came out of this is one of the OLPC guys, Walter Bender, um, he wrote a, so he has this thing, um, it's like turtle graphics. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's like a turtle that traces Lego. Lego. Oh, okay. But so he wrote a really cool script that takes a, um, a UFO glyph and converts it into a format that Turtle Graphics, his Turtle Graphics program can read. So this is something like I've been, I've been kind of looking at that. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, there's um, just really quick. This is. Um, So this is like um, so this is what like turtle graphics comes like in um, Python. So you can do things like this is like a turtle graphics. You're basically telling like you can see here it says like the turtle's pen that his tail is the pen, and so he raises and lowers his tail. So I'm I'm saying like the pen up and then go to and then so. Uh, you run this, like this is a graphing calculator, but it's only, it's only like 
50 lines of Python. Um, so like that kind of thing. You could probably use that to write a cross-platform font editor. Um, my, my kind of attitude towards free software, I think of it like health food a lot. Like, there's like, the best health food doesn't look like conventional food. And I think that a lot of this free software stuff is like stuff in like the early days of health food. Like health food companies would try to just make a health food version of <laughs> like conventional food. And that didn't really, you know, like um, like organic Cheetos or something. But I think that like free software should like really embrace its strengths and not try to just be like GIMP or something. GIMP and Inkscape. It's like, oh, we're the like the free versions of this proprietary tool, and we like map exactly to its features. And I think that tool those tools are kind of held back by that approach. Uh, and then tfont, so there's um, like Adrian's working on a new file format that's like a, an approach that will maybe replace UFO and act as something that could be like a like a a universal exchange format for font information. But that's this is JSON. This JSON, that, yeah. So the the Glyphs font editor uses JSON instead of XML, which uses pseudo JSON. What is stupid? Yeah. Do you want to see it? It's like the ugly. It's not pretty. <laughs> So this is this is a but as you can see, what it lo it loses readability, where like a UFO is human readable and a glyphs file. Is not, but I, for a lot of people, that's a totally acceptable trade-off. Yeah. So what, Ryan, why come with a So we're getting a new format, but you're just not sure when the problem is open. You always want to turn it. It's kind of like. Well, there's also. So there's. The, each format has a group of people behind it. Right. I know. It's, and it's, it's like samples, <laughs> right? It's, it's like. It's, oh, great. You know, we all know the XKC. Now there's multiple standards. Yeah. It's not compatible. Let's make one that's compatible with everything. And this. Yeah. This, um, the current font um, s source format wars are like a perfect example of that cartoon. Oh, uh, it's like 3D format. Yeah. It's the same shit, right? It's only with a new one, right? I like OBJ, it's very readable. Yeah, but now there's this new one where basically Facebook is investing a lot of money. In, I mean, not investing, but Facebook just made a, so you can embed 3D files in, in Facebook. They now support this this new format, which is like, of course, there's so many like Facebook says you can do it on the face. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like it creates a wave in the industry. It's like, oh, truck, we're gonna have do not support this. Uh, yeah. 
Well, it's, 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 I mean, it's a common language for somebody to tell somebody. <laughs> but, but then in the 3D world, aren't there the like, conversion libraries that convert then into conversion? <sighs> yeah, but it never works. So. I mean, it's like, oh, then you got your texture and so on. Or it's not exporting the animation, or it's not exporting the skeletons, or it's not, like, it's converting, it doesn't have a representation for the meshing, whatever. There's always something. And so really quick, I got two more things. No, no, yeah, so yeah, this yeah. is, I started working, this was the project I started working on. I was trying to solve the problem of like, I just thought, for me as like, I'm a, maybe I'm an intermediate Python programmer now. I definitely was a beginner Python programmer. I feel like I'm a, I will be an intermediate Python programmer by the end of the year. <laughs> but, I wanted something that was easier to, um, like a font editor that was easier to contribute to than true font. And so I was like thinking, I was like, well, why don't I just write like a command line TU, so it's called a TUI, like a text user interface. I was like, so why don't I, I write like a command line text user interface that's just like a bunch of selections of like UFO tools. So I, like I had written a script that was like for converting UFOs to TTFs, um, and there's things like um, there's things like Font Make and Font Bakery, which are these like command line tools for like compiling fonts or for testing fonts. And so, but instead of having like a command line tool that like a command line tool like Font Make might be a little bit difficult for some designers to use, but I think you could actually do like a command line tool with a menu like this that would be a little bit easier for designers to use, kind of like a first step into the command line. So yeah, so basically, but the idea was that you would just have these like modular options and it would be, they would all be separated into like their own folders and like all individually named and like it would be like an exercise in like the you're designing an easy to use Python program, and it's just going to be clear, and you're not going to let like a, like a graphics framework dictate how your program looks. Like so, it's like optimizing for open source contributors, which is totally like I think that's like a whole field of design that like I want to get into is like how do you like designing a Python program to encourage contributors, like, which is something you can do. Like, you can say, like, we're going to start this Python project, and we're not going to compromise on making it easy to contribute to. Just see how the software turns off. And the like, text user interfaces are awesome, because they're 100% they're text. Like, I think graphic designers should love this, because it's it's type. You're just designing with type. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's so, the, like, so you type. You go to the command line. You hit little UFO, and then you do like. So let's do like nine. Choice nine. Exit called. Bye. Yep. And then it. <laughs> And I'm like refactoring it right now, so it's... But anyway, so the last thing is, um, so the reason I think that like this stuff's gonna get really exciting in the future is things like, I've spent a lot of time on, which I found out about this stuff through Mastodon, but I met a lot of people on Mastodon that are really into constructed languages and constructed scripts. And so this is a someone amateur type design that they they took they designed these Tokipona glyphs, which Tokipona is a constructed language, and they have their own design script. Yeah. So, 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 so there's like so you can design like the Latin alphabet just evolved. Over, I mean, people designed it like individual scribes designed the Latin alphabet, but it wasn't 
a design project. So there's something like Hangul, or how do you say Hangul? The Korean language was designed by like a king who just decided like I'm going to design a language, and it works, and it's a great script. And so the idea is like I'm really interested in like the like Sepier Warp stuff. Like this has been discredited as like in a serious academic way, but there's a chapter in there on a universal auxiliary language, and the idea is that. Um, like a glo like so, there's also the concept of like global, like a global design style, like the international typographic design style wasn't really international. It was like Latin, and it was like European design aesthetics. So I think like now there's this whole thing where like graphic designers are trying to figure out like what is the global graphic like? Does the Earth have a graphic design style? And in a way that like. Like I don't think that Latin, the Latin alphabet, will, would ever be like a perfect solution to, because what we're doing, like we're just saying, like if you talk to a lot of type designers, they'll say the Latin alphabet won, and that's now like the global script. But I think like history is going to progress, and like enough people have difficulty with it that at some point, um, and as more and more, as like. We get more and more leisure time, and people just—it's—it's it's something that's there to be done. Like there was like, if you're familiar with like Esperanto, um, the idea of like people used to be really into the idea that we would have an international language, and that everyone would speak the international language, and then they would speak their like local, local language. Yeah. Um, and so that book argues that. People, like modernity will never be satisfied with an imposed language, and the only solution is to somehow have like a global collaboration to create a language that everyone has a part in creating, and is like a language of the world. Um, and so, like part of doing that, like free software tools are the perfect tool for this because yeah. um, people in certain in certain countries maps are too expensive so um, and it makes the tools like freely available and so this is like doing stuff like this is like a perfect example of like why I think that like working on free software font editors is an interesting project because I want to like encourage people to do stuff like this and this was made, this actually uses um, open type substitutions. So if you type a word in English, it recognizes that word and it converts it to symbols. So like toki, like you write T-O-K-I. Like, that, well, I, this would actually make sense. So this is the, I designed these slides in, um, Drawbot, and you can kind of see at the end, like, so these are, you can see that the input is, um, yeah, just ASCII, it's like Latin characters, but because of the open type substitution, it renders as these, which is amazing, like, I think that's, and so, so you put it in like when you're designing a font there's like certain code that you can put in so you just say um, I mean oh, I actually that's why they came with this font where it's like you can insert numbers and certain characters and you can also graph yeah yeah so that was using that was using the I same I <laughs> So these are these are the source um, the source files for that project. Um, yeah, so you can kind of see like these are the and what's really beautiful about this is this is a totally amateur project. Like these aren't graphic design students. These are like 
people that have no knowledge of graphics design software, they're just really into this idea. And the tools they're using, like if you look at the, um, if you look at like the way they've laid everything out, like is they're really lacking in having the right tools. Like they didn't actually, there's no source file. Um, so there's no, um, they didn't, this is their GitHub repo. And yeah, so there's no like glyphs or UFO, they just saved everything. Because I don't know, I think they somehow like applied I don't know what software they're using, but I know that they were struggling. <laughs> like, That's great. So something like Little Producer would be good. Yeah. I go on like so. I was on Mastodon. I was getting really <laughs> into the like constructed language stuff on there, and then I got I got on a bunch of constructed language Discord servers, <laughs> and then you know then I was like in the rabbit hole. <laughs> I don't even know how I got here. <laughs> that's, so that's what I like. Yeah. There's so there's a huge focus on like um, language yeah, and language like the importance. Yeah. And, and and questioning all that like there's questions of identity, gender, uh, representation, uh, group forming. Because you if you want to learn a language, you can go on there and there's like yeah. you can speak that language and like try to learn it and like I'll go on there and I can speak Toki Pona, but like. I just like I have like a like leisurely evening. I'll just like practice my tokipona. Tokipona. This is the best one. Well, there's only there's only 120 words. Yeah, and, and also like, like there is there is there's probably an instance where you can only talk like the intro. Yeah. yeah. That's what I like about Mastodon. It's like, hey. Well, there is there's the like there's like a Star Trek instance where you like have to be in character. <laughs> That's what I, I mean, that's what I love. I'm, that's the other reason I'm into like free software is, you know, like I grew up on like deviant art and like online art communities and like that just like, I love that energy of like yeah. young people on computers, like making graphic art is just like, I wish that I could just be in that community forever, but I'm like an adult now. And so I'm trying to support those people <laughs> with, by making software. But I, I think that like though I'm endlessly inspired by like, those communities. Like I think that yeah, yeah. I think that's it. Thanks for. I'll see if my um I'll see if my recording worked.